Let's talk about carrier-mediated transport. So depending on the number of molecules that are being transported, you call them either a uniport, if it's just one molecule. If two molecules are transported in the same direction, it's a symport. And if we transport two substances in opposite directions, we call it an antiport. And these um, transport molecules are very specific. Uh, sometimes you can run into problems with competition for, depending on concentration gradients usually, or saturation, there's a transport maximum that these channels have, of course. So here's an example of what something like this might look like. Uh, for example, a glucose transporter looks like this. It will capture a molecule, let's say, on this side, invite it inside of this um, channel um, protein and then it will change configuration and let it out on the other side and it will just come out on the other side so that's how you can some get something across and here are some examples given uh, here we have uh, a glucose transporter a uniport it's just transporting glucose across a, a biological membrane um, here's another example given a symport where we have um, sodium and glucose going in the same direction so that would be a co-transporter or symport and then we have an antiport here where the sodium is pumped in one direction and potassium in the opposite direction this one here happens to be a pump um, because we have expenditure of energy so here ATP is being used and you know it's a pump and it's active transport okay so let's take a look more at carrier mediated transport and facilitated diffusion so remember diffuse this is still diffusion facilitated diffusion means that we just have some sort of a pore we have some transport uh, protein that can open or close and then it will facilitate the diffusion but it doesn't require any energy because we're relying on a concentration gradient so we're going down a concentration gradient you don't need any atp and they're relying typically on a conformational change in the transport molecule um, to either op allow the flux of something or not but you gotta still have those concentration gradients. In active transport, uh, we're using also these carrier proteins, but now you need to use ATP because you, you don't need a concentration gradient. A lot of times, in fact, you're going against a concentration gradient or you're building one up. And so in order to do that, you need to put in work and that requires the expenditure of um, ATP. Uh, here's a sort of a silly example that's in your textbook i guess it's something like the panama canal or something uh, here we're going from the pacific ocean to the atlantic ocean and so uh, you have a canal right here so you're letting the little boat inside and you're closing the gate behind the boat and now it's in the center right there and then you're opening on the other side and you let it out on the atlantic side here that's pretty close um so you can picture that in terms of the membrane so we have these gating mechanisms in these transport molecules. Okay, here's an example where you have a molecule that needs to be transported, this red little sphere right there, and it's going into the transporter and it's binding temporarily to this place right here. Then, then the transporter will close on this side and it will open on the other side. You have um, then an opening and your <clears throat> little ball is coming out. So that would be a uniport. And here, some more specific examples are shown. It would be a glucose transporter. And um, <clears throat> if we want glucose, you can see there's a concentration gradient. There's a lot of glucose on the outside, not much on the inside of the cell right here. You have a transport molecule because glucose couldn't just cross the phospholipid bilayer, so you need a transporter. And so now uh, we can allow the flux of glucose down its concentration gradient. All we need to do is open up the pore. So once we open this glucose transporter, then the glucose will go down its concentration gradient into the cell. And um, once we have an equilibrium, well, then the diffusion will stop. Now, um, if you want to transport, uh, I don't know, uh, glucose against the concentration gradient, well, then you gotta have to, you're going to have to put in energy into the now here are some examples of primary active transporters. So you know active means that um, we need to use ATP. Um, these are all very important um, pumps right here, but the 
ultimately the 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 most important one I would say is the sodium potassium pump and you will hear a lot more about this one um, it's an antiport it pumps sodium to the outside of the cell potassium to the inside of the cell to establish this very uh, very important concentration gradient that you need for your nervous system to function so that's an antiport and then we have here a uniport example another uniport uh, hydrogen ATPase proton pump and then an antiport here hydrogen potassium ATPase anyway you'll hear much more about the sodium potassium pump that's the one that's super important this one right here okay and um, here is the um, action of the sodium potassium pump it will pump um, sodium to the outside of the cell so we're grabbing on to three sodiums for every two potassiums that come in so three sodiums out will be pushed out for every two potassiums coming in and um, this operation only works with the expenditure of energy because we're creating very steep concentration gradients you want almost all the potassium inside the cell and almost all of the sodium on the outside of the cell so here are the another way of showing how the sodium potassium pump works right here and there you have we're starting with one uh, you have three sodiums that you're loading up on this side then you're gonna have ATP hydrolysis to uh, generate a conformational change that kicks out these three sodiums to the outside of the cell and then we're gonna load up two potassiums they, these two potassiums are coming in and then we're gonna undergo the same conformational change I guess as before opening up on the other side and putting the two potassiums to the inside of the cell okay so here are some more examples of secondary active transporters sort of I call that the buy one get one free deal where you are actively transporting one item and you get a second item for free it sort of hitches a free ride but uh, we will talk more about these when we get to the digestive system so here, sodium glucose co-transporter, just briefly, there you have a buy one get one free deal where you are um, transporting one item under expenditure of energy and the other one sort of comes along for a free ride. Here we have the sodium and the glucose loading up. It's um, a sim port, so we're going in the same direction. And then um, <clears throat> once we loaded up our sodium and, and um, glucose, then we're going to open up on the other side and we're going to let it out on the other side. So here, <clears throat> the glucose transporter, another time, another example here. That's just a unit port right here showing glucose loading in here and then conformational change of the transport protein and we're letting it out on the other side. And here you have an example of a competitive inhibitor. Uh, this maltose um, molecule blocks the binding site for glucose. And so then yeah, you're blocking uh, the glucose from entering right there. And uh, that would be considered an inhibitor to the glucose transport. A brief word here about saturation and competition also. Uh, the um, uh, every one of these transport molecules has a transport maximum and that can be different for different transporters but they all will reach a transport maximum and from then they cannot increase the rate of transport anymore so they reach a transport maximum at a certain level and then you can increase uh, the substrate, substrate concentration as much as you want you can bring it really high but the transporter can only do so much and so they all reach a transport maximum eventually. And uh, competition, uh, sometimes we have competition for binding sites and um, if you add additional substances you might slow down the rate of glucose transport in this case. Uh, if you have glucose and galactose you're slowing down the rate. If it's glucose only then there's no competition for anything. Let's move on to vesicular transport. It's sort of bulk transport. Um, you can package a lot of stuff up into a vesicle and then move it where you want it to be. Of course, it's going to cost you quite a bit of energy. Uh, vesicular transport, uh, that would be exo and endocytosis. Uh, let's talk first about endocytosis. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is phagocytosis. So phagocytosis means that phago means to eat, cyto means cell, so it's literally cell eating. That means the cell will engulf a particle and then internalize it, package up into a vesicle. That's phagocytosis. Um, there are various white blood cells that are doing that for a living. 
uh, they will engulf like a neutrophil or macrophage they will engulf particles and then digest um, these these bacteria or whatever they engulfed and that's phagocytosis and then endocytosis is sort of the general term. Uh, it could be phagocytosis um, if the cell eats something solid. If the cell eats something um, liquid, um, then it would be considered pinocytosis. And if we're using a receptor to internalize the stuff, then we call it receptor-mediated endocytosis, sort of more specific. And um, also, endocytosis can be part of this membrane recycling because every time you do endo or exocytosis, there's a little patch of membrane involved with that. And so uh, endo and exocytosis sort of balance each other out, out for membrane recycling. Okay, so the vesicular transport, let's take a look at how this works in a little bit more detail. Uh, we're just going to focus on the exocytosis. There would be a lot to be said about clathrin-coated vesicles, but we're not getting into that right now. So here, I just want to show you how uh, phagocytosis works. So let's say here we have a little neutrophil or macrophage, and here's a bacterium, and we need to get rid of this bacterium. So here is a cell, and it's starting to form these pseudopods, these bulges. It starts to bulge out and starts to engulf that bacterium until it fully encloses it, and then here here it is fully enclosed, so now this bacterium is internalized and it's inside of a um, vesicle. Then we're going to fuse a lysosome that has uh, digestive enzymes in it. We're going to fuse it with this um, with this um, vesicle, and then we have a phagolysosome, and then this way this bacterium is going to be killed and eaten up. So here, in pieces, I'm just scrolling through the slides, a bacterium right there, phagocytic cell comes along, and we need to engulf this thing. Uh, we're going to do that, and eventually we're going to have it engulfed fully, have it internalized, so we're already here inside of the cell, and then um, we're going to fuse some lysosomes with it to digest this bacterium right here, and eventually then this bacterium is dead, and we're going to maybe just get rid of the pieces that we have digested. And here we have an example of uh, receptor-mediated endocytosis. So it's a pretty crowded slide, and I have it in pieces um, if you go more down. So we'll start here sort of with the summary. Uh, we have here a little ligand, this ye yellow uh, thing, is binding to its re receptor right here. So that's the first thing. So once we have that receptor-ligand interaction, now we want to internalize this. So the cell starts to form a vesicle. So it will for first f form this little dip here, a stitch, and then it will form fully a vesicle. It will. It may or may not coat this vesicle. So here's a class one coat shown. But uh, any, anyway, we so we want this ligand um, receptor complex. We want to internalize it in a vesicle, and we're going to do this by pinching off a little patch of membrane that then gets transported within the cell. And then, of course, um, we lost a little patch of membrane right here by pinching that off. So we can recycle that um, by doing exocytosis once we have taken off this ligand and process it, whatever we wanted to do with it as a cell. And now we're recycling this patch of membrane uh, by fusing it back with the membrane and, and then we sort of returned that patch of membrane back. And here in pieces, the ligand first binds to the receptor. That's the first step. We need to have a ligand binding to the receptor molecule right here. And then we start forming this little ditch and uh, we internalize it. We may or may not coat this vesicle. Coating helps the cell to know what to do with it, basically. So here, but this is an example of endocytosis. We're going to pinch off a little patch of membrane, and then we're going to transport that inside of the cell. So here it is now inside of the cell, fully internalized by endocytosis inside of the cell. Now we need to rip off that yellow thing that we were interested in. So we need to get the yellow parts off. And now here we have these receptor molecules that we just want to return to the membrane. So we're going to, uh, we ripped off the yellow pieces right here. And we just need to return now this patch of membrane that has the receptor embedded. So this is what we want back. Uh, so this is something that we need to ship over here and then return that patch of membrane. And here it is fusing with the plasma membrane and there's the full picture again so this is what we had as the first slide
Now we're going to finish off this lecture here by looking at epithelial transport, and that is very important in physiology. So we have lots of um, places where we need to absorb materials. Think of the renal tubules or your small intestine needs to absorb nutrients that you've digested. And so whenever you have an epithelium, um, where stuff needs to be transported across, we need to do epithelial transport. The um, the epithelium has two sides. One is facing the interior of this tubular um, structure, let's say the small intestine, the interior of the small intestine or the interior of the renal tubule. That is the apical membrane, okay? And then on the other side, we're gonna have the basal membrane. And we need to, a lot of times, we need to do transcellular transport. So it means we need to go across the entire cell. We can also try to go between two cells, and this depends on the, the uh, different scenario, but if we have, if we go between cells, we do paracellular transport. Now let's take a look at what that looks like. So here are some examples. Um, the absorption from the lumen to the extracellular fluid compartment, so that would be um, in the renal tubules and intestine, like I said, or transcellular uh, transport of glucose uses these membrane proteins we saw earlier. Okay, so here is an example of both versions. If we go uh, paracellular, that means we would go between cells and we go just across here. So we're just going to use the space between two cells if it's possible. But most of the time we actually need to do transepithelial transport. That means we need to go all the way across the cell. So that means we need to absorb this little green thing here and we just want to transport it and spit it out on the other side. We want to transport it across. Or we're going to do an antiport where we're going to, in exchange for one thing going this way, we're going to transport another thing going the other way. So that happens too. And we will talk much more about that when we do renal physiology and um, also gastrointestinal physiology. So here is a little bit more detail provided. And again, this will come back for you for sure. In renal physiology, we'll talk a lot about sodium glucose reabsorption out of the um, TSC. This is even the lumen of the kidney or the intestine. They're talking about that. So... Um, well, you need to reabsorb your glucose that you filtered out um, at first, and then now you need to reabsorb it. So uh, here in this case, we're using a glucose sodium co-transport, and uh, we're going to have in the apical membrane, we're going to have this transport uh, molecule, and then we're going to go across. We're going to transport the glucose across, and then here we need another transport protein for the glucose alone. And then here, for the sodium, we're going to use an ATPase that exchanges um, sodium and potassium. But you can see that the glucose that was in the lumen of the renal tubule, for example, it needs to go all the way across this epithelium and then come out on the other side. And the last slide here is a reference to a membrane transport video that I'm going to post for you. Don't worry, it's not as lengthy as my lecture has been. Hopefully you guys are still awake. So anyway, I'm going to post that AMP AP Flix uh, membrane transport. It's a very good one. I really like that one. It summarizes everything very nicely that you need to know about this lecture. Also, be sure to do the lab. Pay attention to this lab. Um, I know you guys don't get to do the lab experiments per se, but I think you can follow along pretty nicely and have some video clips showing people doing the agar diffusion and whatnot. So uh, please be sure that you understand fusion, especially osmosis, the terms about tonicity, was well, all very important. It's all really it's explained, I think, pretty well in the lab. So be sure that you use this lecture and the lab in conjunction with one another. They really support each other.